There's no place like the cinema. The four walls that encompass the magic of the movies, the posters on the walls, the auditoriums filled with rows and rows of seats, the smell of the popcorn and the trails before the film. It's the only place you get this experience authentically. I love going to the cinema. It's a place I go to switch my brain off and get absorbed into a story, to have a different experience. As a film fan, there's no better place to watch films than on the big screen. In this video essay, I'll talk about all things cinema, as well as hearing from the owner of Parkway Cinema in Barnsley to get some insight into the logistics of running a cinema and the important role of independent cinemas to the film industry. So grab some popcorn and sit back to take a look behind the screens. People have been going to the cinema for more than a century. From Citizen Kane to Pulp Fiction, there have been so many experiences shared on the silver screen. There are a few films that hold a place in cinema history for originating different elements. Fans of Jordan Peele's Nope will be aware of this one. The Horse in Motion by Edward Mybridge was technically the first ever motion picture. Made in 1878, it consists of 12 images of a horse taken on 12 different cameras that were viewed on Mybridge's invention of a zoopracoscope, which is essentially a wheel with each image placed on the edge of it, and when you spin it really fast, it assimilates movement. Then there was Round Hay Garden Scene in 1888, which is believed to be the oldest surviving film as it showed consecutive movement and was created using a motion picture camera rather than compiling multiple still images. Filmed in Leeds, it depicts some people walking around a garden for two seconds, and that's cinema. Of course, over time, the mediums developed, where films are coming longer with more complex stories. The invention of talking pictures made huge strides for the industry, as well as colour, which made films more like the ones that we know today. By the end of the 1930s, nearly all feature-length films were presented with synchronised sound, and some were in full colour too. The introduction of sound secured the important role of the American film industry, and the golden age of Hollywood began. Research from the Science and Media Museum's website shows how popular cinema going was at the time. They say, during the 1930s and 1940s, cinema was the principal form of popular entertainment, with people often attending cinemas twice a week. Ornate super cinemas or picture palaces offering extra facilities such as cafes and ballrooms came to towns and cities. Many of them could hold over 3,000 people in a single auditorium. In Britain, the highest attendances occurred in 1946, with over 31 million visits to the cinema each week. Films that did especially well at the time include Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, as well as Gone with the Wind, which is still the highest grossing film of all time worldwide and just for inflation, with 35 million people going to see it in the UK. With the invention of television and the influx of them in homes in the 1950s, people had audio-visual entertainment at their fingertips in their very own homes without the need to go anywhere or spend any money. For people that didn't live near the cinema, they don't have to travel that far to watch something now, so they just stayed at home. In order to combat the loss in film revenue, cinemas had to utilise what they had that televisions didn't, a huge screen and colour images. Remember, TVs only showed black and white images at the time, so it was a great advantage for cinemas. Cinemascope was a new widescreen format that involved compressing a wide image onto 35mm film and decompressing it when you project it at a larger size. The screen was curved too, with an advert for the format saying, Cinerama gives us just about the full scope of normal vision, in which you see so much out the corner of your eye. Very early attempts of 3D emerged in the 50s too, but due to the expense and imperfections of cinema's 3D technology, it took several decades for 3D to return, where it became more popular. There was even smell of vision where they diffused different smells into the auditorium that synced up with the film so that you could smell what you saw on screen. This was first used in the film Scent of Mystery in 1960, with 15 different scents used from shoe polish to peaches. The fad never caught on, however, with director Jack Cardiff saying, one film won't to erase from my memory. The reason for that is, through no fault of my own, the film was a complete disaster. Eventually, the Hollywood studios gave in to the success of TV and sold the rights to their older films to be shown on air, which drew attention to the films and gave people a reason to buy television sets, so it worked out for everyone. The television format also gave chance for advertisements, and film studios jumped on this when they got chance. The biggest example of TV marketing gone well is Jaws. Universal spent an unprecedented $700,000 on a national TV spot campaign, with 12 30-second ads shown each night for a while in June 1975 before the film's release. This clearly worked in the film's favour as it became the highest grossing film of all time at the time. A huge problem the film industry has faced more prevalently since the dawn of the internet is film piracy. Piracy is where you film, download or share illegal recordings of films gained without permission. Gone are the days of people selling counterfeit DVDs on the street, now it's as easy as typing in a website URL and accessing plenty of content for free. This is damaging to not just the industry, but the people spending months or even years of their time making the films. I, and a lot of people, see buying a cinema ticket the same as casting a vote. 
You're telling cinemas and studios what you want to see and that you support that film. There's a reason that Marvel Studios make three films a year and cinemas prioritise blockbusters. People keep coming to see them. Some films really do lose out on a lot of money due to piracy. A prime example of this is Kick-Ass 2 from 2014. Chloe Grace Moretz, who played Hit Girl in the film, explained in an interview that due to piracy, a third one couldn't be made. She said, You make these movies for the fanboys, but nowadays everyone seems to pirate them rather than watch them in the movie theatre. Kick-Ass 2 was the number one most pirated film of the year, but that doesn't help us when we need box office figures. We need to prove to the distributors that we can make money from a third and fourth film, but because it didn't do so well, we can't make another one. If you want more than one movie, everyone has to go see the films at the cinema. It's all about numbers in the theatre. Now it's never clear with piracy numbers of the actual circumstances behind why people are watching it. They might be going to pay to see it in the cinema, or they might have never even thought about doing that and we're always going to watch it online for free. So it's not as easy as X number of people watched it, which equates to X amount of lost box office, because we just don't know. The point is, piracy is stealing, and it is against the law, however you spin it. But if you want to see a film, go spend your money to support it so it does well and there's more chance of sequels. The streaming age has made pirating films even more convenient, as streaming services originals are available in HD right away with several big films being released either straight to streaming or earlier than they used to. People who want to watch those films illegally have to wait less time than ever to access these films. The problem is, once you stream a film, the pirates are on it straight away. Absolutely straight away. You say Turning Red, for example, the day that hit Disney+, Plus, the very day, it was available as a pirate, and it was absolutely perfect copy. I know that because I actually saw a sample of it myself. So, to me, it seems to be that if you're a studio and you release it on your digital platform, you're shooting yourself in the foot straight away because you've lost all the theatrical release, so the millions that that would bring in have gone. And as soon as it's, the, like I said, it's a streaming platform, it's pirated. So it dilutes the amount of people that are watching that film massively. And I think they've realised that now, to be honest. Most studios have realised that. Differing distribution windows also serve as an excuse for watching films legally. For example, here in the UK, we get some films much later than the US. These usually include awards films that come out at the end of the year for America and in January and February for us, like Babylon and the Fablemans. And the distributor I've noticed have a big issue with this is A24. The studio consistently makes films that both film fans and critics enjoy, such as Lady Bird and The Lighthouse, but we tend to get them months after the US. I'll give you two examples that couldn't be less alike. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, the delightful live action slash stop motion animation blend released in the States in July last year. We didn't get it over here in the UK until the middle of February this year, five months after it was available digitally elsewhere. The same goes for the X prequel Pearl, starring Hollywood's latest screen queen Mia Goth. Its US premiere was in September and we had to wait until March to see it, so a lot of people have already sorted out online in HD or just lost interest at that point. I believe that if they release simultaneously with other countries, piracy would be a much smaller issue, especially because these are small independent films that rely on the box office to succeed. This is why it's so important to support smaller films. If you're interested, your money is far more valuable to them than it is to the latest blockbuster. I don't need to be the one to tell you that the pandemic hit everyone hard, and one of the industries that was hit hardest was the film industry. Cinemas were forced to close their doors for months at a time in 2020 and 2021 with very little warning when to do anything. When lockdown happened, we had massive financial concerns, absolutely huge financial concerns, as you can imagine. It's a big building, we had a lot of staff, and we, at that point we had no clue what was happening. There was no mention of furlough, there was no mention of anything, it was just, you've got to close. We didn't make any staff redundant, and it turned out we didn't need to because the furlough scheme was brilliant. So we were able to put all our staff onto furlough, every one of them went onto furlough. It was a huge weight off for us. We couldn't get a reduction on the rent, we did try, so we didn't get that. Um, but because the place was shut, we weren't paying massive amounts of electricity, gas and all that. So we started with a huge worry, I did, what's going to happen. Um, but within a few weeks, it certainly settled down and, and it was okay. With the cinemas closed, it left the industry that relies on showing these expensive films in cinemas having to resort to other ways of distributing their films. The four ways studios seemed to go about it was to delay the films and wait for cinemas, sell to streamers, put them on paid video on demand, or give them simultaneous releases. The film that changed everything probably isn't the one you'd expect. Trolls World Tour was set to release on the 20th of March 2020 in the UK, which was then pushed back to the 6th of April due to the rising COVID-19 pandemic, and was meant to release on the 10th of April in the US. In the end, they released it on VOD, and in the markets where cinemas were open, they'd released them there, which made it the first ever day and day a theatrical and VOD release. It cost £15.99 to rent the film for 48 hours, which is a steep price tag for anyone. They also put their other titles that were in cinemas when lockdown hit on PVOD for the same price. Understandably, cinema chains weren't happy with that decision to cut them out of the picture. 
Traditionally, films released in the cinema had a 90-day window, so they could exclusively show those films and they can't be available anywhere else until the window is over. Odeon and Cineworld actually planned to ban all Universal films being shown in their cinemas because, as Cineworld's statement said, Universal unilaterally chose to break our understanding. If this went through, it could have been catastrophic for the industry, but they reached a deal in the end. Cineworld's policy has always been they won't show anything that's day and date on release that you can watch at home. That's always been their policy. So the studios that did agree a deal with Cineworld agreed that um, they would lengthen the window from zero to whatever it happened to be, two, three weeks, four weeks, um, in, in order for um, their films to qualify to be shown in Cineworld cinemas. In the UK, the cinemas get a theatrical window between a couple of weeks to 45 days, depending on a few factors, before a film releases on PVOD. This is the same deal they made with Warner Brothers and has since become the new normal for all studios. This is a huge change for the industry as 90 days used to be the industry standard and gives cinemas near enough three months to show the films while they were on DVD or digital. Now the studios are essentially capping the box office results by being greedy and putting them on to buy online after a month when they're still at their peak in the box office. Warner Bros also made a bold move by releasing their entire 2021 slate on their streaming service HBO Max day and date other cinemas. A move that saw blockbusters like Dune and The Suicide Squad stream for free with a HBO Max subscription when they were still in cinemas. This received backlash from a lot of the creatives who work with Warner Bros, namely their directors. The biggest name to speak out against the decision was Christopher Nolan. He said, Some of our industry's biggest filmmakers and most important movie stars went to bed the night before thinking that they were working for the greatest movie studio and woke up to find out that they were working for the worst streaming service. This led him to leave Warner Bros to make his next film with Universal, who offered him better terms. Oppenheimer released in cinemas in July. Denis Villeneuve actually wrote an open letter on the Variety website bashing the company's decision, saying, Streaming can produce great content, but not movies of Dune's scope and scale. Warner Brothers' decision means Dune won't have the chance to perform financially in order to be viable and piracy will ultimately triumph. Warner Bros. might have just killed the Dune franchise. Dune cost $165 million to make and is based on Frank Herbert's epic sci-fi novel, intended to be the first film of two. The title card in the film even says Dune Part 1. So with the streaming deal, it threatened the box office for a film of such size. It desperately needed to be able to make a budget to get a sequel greenlit. Thankfully, in the end, a sequel was greenlit after the success of the first film and releases this year in cinemas. Warner Bros. didn't continue this deal in 2022 or onwards. Presently, we're in the recovery period for the industry. Figures are steadily increasing, but the next goal is to reach the heights of 2019. Here is a look at the UK box office over the past few years. As you can see, from 2015 to 2019, the numbers were over £1.2 billion, which is where they were in the prime. Then when lockdown happened, figures plummeted 76.3%, with takings clocking in at only £296.7 million 2020. 2021 saw a close return to form with £556.9 million, with smash hit Spider-Man No Way Home releasing in December and bringing in a large percentage of that. And last year we saw £902 million in takings, which is getting even close to pre-pandemic levels. 2022 was an epic year for films, and one of the best ever in my opinion, with studios releasing banger after banger and so many box office hits, such as Top Gun Maverick, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Minions Rise of Gru, and right at the end of the year we got Avatar The Way of Water, which became one of the highest grossing films of all time. Seeing people return to cinemas in such huge numbers is great to see. To see cinemas getting business and studios seeing a good return on their products, Parkway have seen success of a certain type of film. Family films, absolutely. Family films. We've just done two weeks of the Super Mario Brothers movie and it's taken the whole industry by storm. It's opened massively, taken hundreds of millions of pounds across the world. It's done really well for us, it's done really well for every cinema that I know that's shown it. We've always been a cinema where family films do well. Uh, we expected Mario to be busy, perhaps not as busy as it was, but we're not complaining. So definitely the family films. Also here, um, we do well with the um, older audience who like to come here because we're not a multiplex and we do treat people with respect, we do talk to people, uh, people do, do appreciate that. And also we do well with um, the horror films. So we've got Evil Dead Rise starts tomorrow. Um, that's a, a perfect film for Barnsley. Barnsley people like horror. Now I want to delve into the industry now. What's thriving and how viewing habits have changed? Superhero films have been the driving force for making money at the box office, with that being the most popular genre over the last 15 years or so. Each entry into the Marvel Cinematic Universe makes hundreds of million pounds regardless of the audience response because of the loyal fan base that they have. They've had a few critical flops recently with Thor Love and Thunder and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania both getting mixed reviews, 
which could show a decline in interest in these films. DC are facing a similar issue with Black Adam, and I would say the massively underrated Shazam 2 being back-to-back -back box office bombs, not even breaking even. This isn't a good sign for the studio, but it does make sense as James Gunn is about to reboot the universe next year, so these remaining films that sit in the old continuity seem irrelevant to some people at the moment. With so many superhero films failing to achieve the highest standards they're expected to hit, we may see them fading in the next few years. And the cinemas are noticing this change in audience retention too. Superheroes, I think there's too much of it now, and uh, we've seen that, and, and it's not just us, in the industry in general, uh, you've noticed now that when these films open, they have a massive opening weekend, Friday, Saturday, into Sunday, and then they drop like a stone. So you, there's, they're no longer run for three, four weeks, capacity audience, we, you have two or three good days, and that's it. So all the fanboys come out and see them, and then it kind of, whoosh, gone. Again, this is my own personal sort of view on this, but I think, they would be ideal to go straight to streaming. Really? I really do, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, or the premium formats. You know, people like to see films like that in IMAX, in 4DX and all that. Absolutely fine, that's what those films are made for. But for cinemas like us, you know, I don't know if you realise this, but when we um, agree to take a film, we have to take it, if it's a new release, it's a minimum 14 days, all shows, and probably 60% um, split to the studio. So it's expensive for us, it ties up a lot of screen time for us, and we know that after three or four days, it's a waste of time. Or certainly, it's not as profitable as it used to be. Sadly, the smaller films still aren't making as much money as fans and studios would like. Something that I noticed with the awards films from the end of last year. The Fablemans, despite being directed by Steven Spielberg and banging a Best Picture nomination, underperformed, making just $45 million back on a $40 million budget. When I saw it in the cinema, it was introduced by Steven Spielberg himself, thanking the audience for coming out to support the film in the cinema. I looked around and saw only four of us in the screen. But other films like Elvis and The Banshees of Inner Sharon found their audiences and stayed in cinemas for months at a time and filled screens, although they weren't huge blockbusters, especially Banshees. Cinemas have started playing more into niches nowadays to keep their piggy bank at a good level. An important factor in what makes Parkway special is their ability to show different types of films you might not see from the bigger chains. Unlike some of the competition, especially the one across the road, um, their policy is they will not screen films that are available on um, any other platforms that will not show their films in any format. So we find that people do want to come and see them if they can. So quite often we will say, yeah, we'll show it. Yeah, it's available on Netflix, it might be available on Amazon or Apple or whatever, but we'll show it and we do get an audience. Mainly the older people, but we do get younger people in as well. Last Sunday I showed, and I never thought I'd ever say this, but I showed a Netflix film that on a 35mm film print. And I never ever thought that Netflix would produce 35mm prints. They did. And we showed All Quiet on the Western Front from a 35mm film print. I was over the moon with it. I do enjoy showing actual film in this modern age where everything's digital and very few cinemas are actually still showing film. Everyone's showing films, well, movies, let's say, digitally. Um, we can and still do show actual film. It's a difficult to get hold of film prints. Film prints are not made anymore for every single film, but there are a lot of classic films out there. We also show 70mm film, which is high definition, massive, massive definition. So yes, we will continue to show 35mm and 70mm films when we can. And it's got to be something worthwhile. Um, we did The Shining a couple of weeks ago, which was fantastic. But we had to get hold of the print, so we have to pay a deposit on the print. I had to insure that print for £10,000. Um, then we have to move it, we have to get it here, it has to be built up, screened by me, then packed back off into its tin, and then we have to ship it back. So we've got, there's all those costs to, to incur. Whereas if we'd have shown the shining from digital, which we could have done, uh, there'd be no shipping cost because that'll be sent to us electronically over the internet. So we can screen that basically at no cost and still pay the same low percentage. But I like to show film. I've worked with film, actual real film, all my life from being 17, my first job was here as a trainee projectionist in this very building, which is why I was so passionate when Odeon decided to close it in 2005. I was like, can't close my cinema, what are you doing? I've not worked here for donkey's years, but you know, I, I'm from the town, I live in the town. Although I was working all over the country, I was working into Europe. This is my home cinema, you know, what are you doing closing this? No, I'm not having it. As great as the bigger companies can be, it's important to support independent cinemas to preserve the history and look out for their offerings, which might offer alternatives to the other cinemas. Lots of the independents are showing live recordings of concerts or pre-recordings of theatre shows which help to keep them in the green. Independent cinemas, I think, are going to play a very important role in the years to come. As we've seen already, the, the amount of available product is 
kind of shrinking, the amount of products you want to show is shrinking. So if you've got a cinema with 10, 12 or even 13 screens, dare I say it, a lot of those screens are going to be showing the same film at just at different times because there are a limited amount of films out there that will bring people to cinemas. We know that and you know the, the, the industry data proves that. Um, every weekend we see the top figures and there'll be two or three films that are doing reasonably well, everything else is way down. We try and do as much different stuff as we can. So we do lots of event cinema. So last night was Coldplay. It was a, a rerun of last year's Coldplay from Buenos Aires. We did that concert last night. Tonight we've got National Theatre, that's good, starring David Tennant. Tomorrow night we're showing Heather's The Musical, which is selling well. Sunday we have Coldplay back on again. We're also doing live stage events. So we did, we had a Dolly Parton tribute last Friday, which went down an absolute storm. We've got lots of stuff, we've got all kinds of, of, of live stuff on stage. Um, and apart from all that, we also look to do slightly quirky films and you've already mentioned this things like the shining um we're going to bring some 70 mil films back in as soon as we can i'm chasing the 70 mil print of oppenheimer as we speak because nolan shot that on 70 mil as he always does and there are prints available we can show 70 millimeter film we're one of the few cinemas and i mean a handful in the country that can do that we're one of them so it'll definitely be showing in Odeon Lesser Square on 70mm. I'd love it to be showing in uh, Parkway Barnes on 70mm too. So we will continue to do as many quirky different things as we can in order to bring people in. Independent cinemas used to have a stigma attached that they were grotty, horrible, filthy, dirty places and you know a little bit seedy. Um, but the one thing that we can provide in an independent cinema, and it's not just us, is customer service. You're treated like a human being, not like a, a walking mullet. Some of the multiplexes are affectionately known in the industry as the McDonald's of the movie industry. You know, it's get in, get, spend as much as you can and get out. We're not like that. We'll talk to people before the film, we'll talk to people after the film. If people have got a problem in there, in, in the auditorium, we'll, see it, we'll sort it out. We have staff in the auditorium as much as we can. So if people are on the phones or talking or being obnoxious, just, we can jump on that straight away. There's definitely going to be a role for independent cinemas going forward, definitely. People like to come to an independent cinema. Tonight we're showing a play from the National Theatre and we will get people from not just Barnsley but all sorts of different areas coming here because they would rather come here to see a film like this. it's more theatrical. We make it, we make it theatrical, we make it theatrical as we, go, as we can. We have a sales train there in the interval, all that kind of stuff. And people like that. They like a bit of old school, and that's kind of where we're at. To wrap things up, the cinema industry is getting back on track. We're seeing some juggernauts releasing and making over a billion dollars. The Super Mario Bros movie, as Rob said, is making hundreds of millions of in mere weeks, but even the smaller films can do well. The horror film Smile that released at the end of last year made $217 million on a $17 million budget, and that's just one success story. Don't get me wrong, there's still the issues. Some films go by unnoticed and some great ones just don't perform well at the box office. Studios need to keep moving away from streaming and back towards cinemas. Sadly, physical media sales are at an all-time low as well, with streaming's dominance. But the industry is doing well. People are coming in and we're seeing lots of success. A big thank you to UK cinema hero Rob Younger for the brilliant interview. If you're from the Barnsley area, Parkway is a great choice for an evening out and I strongly recommend that you give them a visit. And with some great films around, there's no better time to go out and see a film at the cinema.